In 1992, the U.S. Senate Select Committee on POW MIA Affairs began a year-long investigation into the fate of American prisoners of war and those listed as missing in action from both the Korean and Vietnam Wars. John McCain insisted on being a member of this Senate committee and was quickly labeled an obstacle to the investigation by POW MIA advocates. The award-winning documentary film, Missing Presumed Dead, The Search for America's POWs, features several Republican leaders shedding light on McCain's otherwise inexplicable motivations for hindering the Senate investigation. Senator McCain seemed to be one of the people that was an obstructionist who was not interested in the truth coming out, uh, who tried to attack people rather than learn what they had to say. In no instance would he ever, ever give in and say there were POWs left behind. And my first question is how would he know or not know? So just that which is reasonable he never exhibited, and I don't know why. Maybe it's a guilt complex. Maybe he promised the Vietnamese something. Okay, and I don't know what it is. Uh, and maybe he actually believes that. That would be the saddest of all. I mean, he was yelling and screaming at me and had me in tears. I mean, I just, I. I... Oh, to everybody, to me, repeat, he was very rude to me on several occasions. He probably did more harm to the idea of trying to get the truth out than any other single person through the efforts he did to block the release of classified intelligence dealing with the POWMIA problem. McCain stepped in and in effect made it harder to get documentation. That certainly hurt us because we had hoped for a massive release of documentation. Many, many documents that were held back for, for no reason and our, our goal on the committee was to just dump this stuff, to, to declassify it literally to the public. Uh, but, of course, uh, you know, uh, they withheld information from the committee. Uh, the U.S. government held all kinds of information from the committee, withheld information from the committee. I know that for a fact. Uh, Even POWs, we knew who wanted to see their own, their own uh, debriefings, were not permitted because of the McCain uh, regulation. But where did McCain get compliments for doing this? The bureaucrats at the Pentagon because it put a workload on them. It put a workload on them for missing and action people. And did we need that bill to handle a Scott Spiker case? Oh, you bet we did. And also what it did, and this is what he really opposed, and if you remember the contentiousness we got into him in his office, was that it would hold the bureaucrats accountable by penalty of law That's if right. they lied or if they withheld information. That's right. And he fought tooth and nail to protect those bureaucrats. Yes. Because they were protecting him. I could never understand that. Why would we, uh, if someone was guilty of withholding information that would help us to solve the mystery of what happened to an MIA and did it deliberately, why would we not want to prosecute that person? Um, so I could never understand it. I thought the language was written. I, th I know Bob Dornan had a hand in it. I thought the language was written very well. Uh, I, I supported it, fought for it hard uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the U.S. Senate and mostly on the Armed Services Committee where we debated it, but it was, it was watered down to basically where it was almost worthless. Now, one of the things that happened with that bill is that we were submarined. The House side, we passed it uh, with no, no, I don't believe anybody opposed it. Was it, it was a pretty much unanimous vote. 401 to 0 on the House, with every single Republican who is serving sponsoring it, and about a third of the Democrats. But on the Senate side, we had, we had one person standing in the way of getting in positions that would have been very tough on government bureaucrats who didn't tell the truth, and that one person was Senator John McCain. He didn't want nobody to check his background, because a lot of POWs that were with him in the camp said he was a, was a collaborator of the enemy. He gave the enemy the information they wanted. But we do know that when he was there, that he cooperated with communist news services in, in giving uh, uh, interviews that, uh, that were um, not flattering to the United States. Information shows that he made over 32 tapes of uh, propaganda for the Vietnamese government. 
certainly you do what you need to do to stay alive. Nobody would fault anybody for that. But there comes a point in time where enough is enough. He made those transcriptions, and in the transcriptions, I heard a POW or heard them coming into his cell and said, Oh my God, is that Admiral McCain's son? Is that the Admiral's son? Is that Johnny telling us that our principal targets are schools, orphanages, hospitals, temples, churches? That was Jane Fonda's line. Where are those transcriptions? Believe me, they're in the archives of the museum, the bragging military, phony military museum in Hanoi. McCain could not have one of those turn up in the middle of a presidential race. He knows that, I know that, and a few other people know that, and that's why he went against Bob Dole's legislation. And he didn't want nobody looking into his background in the camp, what went on in that camp. That stuff is still classified, so nobody can see it. And he just had it classified forever, so nobody will ever look at it. Uh, that he was given special treatment, and he was put in a room with uh, two other defectors who were later uh, given special treatment. Uh, although I will say to his credit that he refused to be repatriated as a result. And it sounds so good at first. McCain was offered the chance to come home. They called him the prince. And he could have. But nobody ever takes that one step beyond that. If John, Admiral John McCain the second Jr., if his son, a lieutenant senior grade, had accepted this princely status and come home in 1967 while the others would sit there for five years, what would the Navy have done with the son of an admiral who opted to get special treatment and come home? No Navy career, no House seat, no Senate seat would have been the end of his career. And they were offering him this chance to go home in one of the three groups that came home in 68, the slip, and McCain calls them. We're all them collaborators. The, yeah, and McCain called them this, except for Doug Hagel, the Slipperies, the Slimies, and the Sleazies. I heard, I once forgot one of those names, and he refreshed my memory. The Slipperies, the Slimies, and the Sleazies. So that meant that he would have become a Slimy, a Sleazy, and a Slippery, ruining his career, and the Admiral's son goes home. So what I'm saying is, yes, he chose to stay, but did he have an alternative if he ever wanted to have a life? And what would it have done to his father? And his activities were sufficiently consistent and widespread in opposing efforts to learn the truth uh, that he was written up in a number of articles as the mature Manchurian candidate in this issue. That in Hanoi, he saw McCain turn red in the face. He even used the term rumble stilk skin, jumping up and down in place in a rage. If you release any of these records that you have here in Hanoi on me or the other POWs, you will never get diplomatic recognition. McCain may have been a, an expert on being a prisoner of war, but he was by no means an expert on the POW issue.